As developers, we love the things we can see. A new framework, we try it. A new API style, we argue about it. A new folder structure, we make a video about it. But none of that is the reason your salary lands in your account. None of that is the reason planes don't double book. None of that is why a hospital can pull your record in three seconds instead of three hours. The thing that makes that happen is quieter. It's the thing that lets a human, or another program, say to a machine, just give me the rows I care about. Not everything, not the whole file, just what matches, select, from, where. That tiny pattern sits beneath banks, airlines, e-commerce, hospitals, logistics, social networks, warehouses, and the cloud itself. It had to be created, tested, debated, adopted, and survive every new technology that tried to replace it. And it's still here. This is the story of how that language came to rule the world's data and never left. In the 1960s, America was racing to the moon. Apollo wasn't one machine. It was thousands of contractors, parts, and configurations that changed weekly. NASA turned to IBM for help and IBM built a system called IMS, the Information Management System. It described rockets the way engineers saw them, stages, subsystems, and components, all nested neatly like a tree. For questions like, show me everything in stage one, IMS worked beautifully, but if you wanted show me every part that uses connector type 27, anywhere in the rocket, IMS broke down. You had to walk the hierarchy manually, root to branch to leaf, every time. The logic lived in the code, not in the data. Businesses faced the same problem. Airlines tracked passengers, flights, seats, banks had customers, accounts, transactions, manufacturers managed products, suppliers, shipments. Data was connected, but systems weren't built to understand connections beyond their trees. Charles Buckman came up with the network model, a looser structure where records could have multiple parents and connections. It was flexible, faster, and closer to how business data really worked, but it still made programmers navigate manually. In his 1973 Turing Award lecture, Buckman said developers had become navigators. They weren't asking questions, they were steering through data structures. Meanwhile, in 1964, American Airlines and IBM created Sabre, a nationwide reservation system that reduced booking time from hours to seconds. It was revolutionary, but decades later, American used the same system to subtly place their own flights at the top of travel agent screens. Competitors protested. Regulations followed, and the lesson was clear. Large data systems weren't neutral, they could tilt the market. By the end of the 1960s, computing had reached a strange point. We could store vast amounts of data, we could update it in real time, we could run national scale systems, but we still had to think like the machine. Programs broke when the structure changed, data was trapped inside models that humans had to manually traverse. That's when an Oxford mathematician at IBM quietly decided to fix it. Edgar F. Codd was frustrated. Every time the way data was stored changed, every program had to be rewritten. It was brittle, messy, and deeply inefficient. So in 1970, he published a paper called A Relational Model of Data for Large Shared Data Banks. It was short, academic, and world-changing. Codd's idea was elegant, represent data not as trees or networks, but as relations, tables connected by shared values instead of pointers. Customer 42 in one table connects to order 42 in another because of the data itself, not because of hard-coded links. He argued that users should be protected from knowing how the data is organized. It was the birth of declarative thinking. Don't tell the machine how to get data, tell it what you want. The problem was that IBM already had IMS, a cash cow. Relational sounded beautiful, but it wasn't a product yet. So IBM cautiously funded a research project to see if it could actually work. They called it System R. System R had to do something COD's paper didn't, figure out how to execute a human query efficiently. Patricia Selinger and her team invented the cost-based optimizer, a system that explored all possible ways to run a query, estimated their cost, and picked the best one. That's the same core idea every database optimizer still uses today, from Oracle to Postgres to Snowflake. But System R also needed a language. COD's notation, based on relational algebra and calculus, was too abstract. Two engineers, Donald Chamberlain and Raymond Boyce, designed something more readable, SQL, short for Structured English Query Language. It used simple words, select, from, where, to express complex ideas. It felt almost like English. A small accident of naming led IBM to shorten it to SQL. Tragically, Boyce died young, before SQL took off. His legacy lived on in Boyce Cod normal form, a design rule that every database student still learns. But by the late 1970s, IBM had the pieces, COD's model, System R's engine, and SQL's language. They just hadn't shipped it. Someone else did. But before we follow that trail, the one where SQL finally leaves IBM's lab and finds its way into the world, a quick word from the people helping make this story possible. This video is brought to you by Convex, the modern backend platform built for developers who want real-time, reactive apps without stitching a dozen services together. Convex gives you the backend muscle, to make your apps real-time, reactive and scalable, without the boilerplate, without the ops overhead, and without wrestling with infrastructure. And then there's Convex Chef, an AI app builder that doesn't just generate code, it understands structure. Chef wires up, authentication, data models, 
background jobs, file storage, and real-time sync on top of Convex's reactive system. You describe the app. Chef assembles it, fully functional, real-time, ready to deploy. Try it yourself at convex.link slash codesource. Describe what you want to build and see how far you can get without writing a single back-end line while keeping your app fast, clean, and future-proof. Now, let's get back to the 1979. In California, three engineers, Larry Ellison, Bob Miner, and Ed Oates were reading IBM's research. They realized something stunning. IBM had proven relational databases worked, but hadn't commercialized them, so they built one themselves, Oracle, and made it compatible with IBM's language. They shipped Oracle version 2 in 1979, skipping version 1, because as Ellison said, no one trusts 1.0. It was the first commercial SQL database. IBM followed later with SQLDS and DB2. Meanwhile, at UC Berkeley, Michael Stonebreaker and Eugene Wong were building Ingress, a university project turned serious contender. It followed COD's ideas, but used a different language called Quell, cleaner and more faithful to the theory. For a while it wasn't clear which language would win. Quell was elegant, SQL was pragmatic, but when standards bodies met to unify the industry, IBM and Oracle backed SQL, and Ingress didn't push Quell hard enough. In 1986, ANSI declared SQL the official database language. A year later, ISO followed. SQL became the standard not because it was perfect, but because it was acceptable to everyone. QL faded, SQL stayed. But being a standard came with baggage. SQL's early flaws were frozen into history, things like null values and duplicate rows. Mathematically, relations are sets with no duplicates. SQL said people like Selectine compromised. COD's purity gave way to practical syntax. Critics like CJ Date have spent decades explaining how SQL betrayed its mathematical roots, but it didn't matter, it worked. As the years passed, SQL evolved. Integrity constraints in 1989 outer joins and better transactions in 1992, recursive queries and triggers in 1999, XML and window functions in 2003, temporal tables in 2011, JSON in 2016. Each version stretched SQL further, but its core remained the same. Select, from, where. By the 1990s, SQL was everywhere. Banks used DB2, enterprises relied on Oracle, Windows servers ran SQL Server, open source had Postgres and MySQL. Every one of them spoke a dialect of the same language. SQL was no longer exciting, it was just normal, the invisible plumbing of the digital world. And that invisibility was its power. Developers could switch jobs, move between systems, and still query data without starting from scratch. Even as vendors added proprietary extensions, PLSQL, TSQL, procedural logic, the basic grammar held. But in the background something was changing. The web arrived. Data exploded. Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, all faced problems relational databases weren't built for. Petabytes of semi-structured data, billions of users, constant change. Traditional databases prized consistency and structure. The web demanded flexibility and scale, so a rebellion began. No SQL. Document stores, key value stores, graph databases, each promised freedom from schema and scalability without joins. MongoDB became the friendly face of that movement. Its JSON-like structure matched how web developers already thought. No tables, no rigid schema, just documents. It felt modern, fast, and forgiving. For a few years, it looked like SQL might fade into history. SQL is dead, people said. The future is flexible. Then reality pushed back. Analysts still wanted to query. Businesses still wanted structure. Hadoop, which began as a file store, added Hive so people could query it with SQL. Facebook built Presto to query massive datasets using SQL. Every new data warehouse that mattered, Redshift, BigQuery, Snowflake, embraced SQL as its interface. Even as storage systems changed, the language stayed. SQL, adapted again. PostgreSQL, MySQL, and SQL Server all added JSON support. The 2016 SQL standard officially included it. The so-called war between SQL and no SQL turned into a truce. Use MongoDB where it fits. Use SQL when you need consistency, analytics or joins. The two worlds stopped fighting and quietly merged. But the arguments never truly ended. Should business logic live in the database, enforced by stored procedures and triggers, or in the application code, where it's testable and versioned? Should you normalize everything to avoid anomalies, or denormalize for performance? Should you prioritize theory or speed? SQL became a mirror for those debates, an evolving language shaped by the compromises of real systems. It also became a battlefield for control. Oracle's licensing practices, Microsoft's bundling, and open source battles around MySQL's acquisition by Sun, and then Oracle, all became part of SQL's long shadow. Postgrap, SQL, once a quiet academic project, emerged as the hero of openness, standards compliant, extensible and free. It became the darling of modern SaaS companies and developers who wanted the power of SQL without the corporate baggage. By the 2010s, SQL wasn't dying, it was thriving. 
inside warehouses, streams and analytics platforms. BigQuery, Snowflake, and Redshift let you query trillions of rows instantly. ClickHouse, DuckDB and other analytical engines brought SQL to the desktop and edge devices. Streaming systems like Flink and Kafka introduced SQL interfaces for real-time data. Everywhere you looked, SQL had evolved, sometimes beyond recognition, but never replaced. And yet, its imperfections remain part of its charm. It's verbose, inconsistent, full of historical quirks, but it's universal. Every data tool since 1970 either speaks SQL, pretends to speak SQL, or is defined in contrast to it. 50 years after COD said users should be protected from knowing how data is organized, they still are. The principle holds. You tell the system what you want, not how to get it. Whether it's PostgreSQL on a laptop, BigQuery in the cloud, or Snowflake across regions, the words are the same. Select from world. It looks like a joke, but it's the story of half a century of engineering, debate, and compromise. Behind it lies IMS, where data was trees, CODACL, where you had to steer, Sabre, where databases shaped markets, COD, who imagined simplicity, System R, which proved it could work, Chamberlain, and Boyce, who gave it words, Oracle, who commercialized it, IBM, who standardized it, Ingres, who fought for purity, Kell, who lost the vote, and alongside it, the open source movement that turned SQL from a product into a public language, MySQL powering the early web, Postgres defining resilience, Isqlite sitting silently inside billions of phones. Next to it, MongoDB and the NoSQL rebellion that forced SQL to grow again. SQL didn't survive by staying pure, it survived by adapting, by being practical, by being everywhere. It isn't a perfect language, it isn't elegant, but it's the language the world speaks when it talks to data. The language that connects banks to payrolls, hospitals to patients, airlines to seats, and now AI models to the datasets they learn from. In a world obsessed with the new, SQL is the quiet constant, the hidden architecture still holding everything together, not because it's flawless but because it's universal. 50 years, countless systems, billions of queries later, we still say it the same way, select, from, where. SQL didn't just change how we talk to databases, it changed how we think about information itself, it turned navigation into conversation, it made the invisible world of data something humans could ask questions of, and get answers back. That's why, half a century later, every developer, every company, every system still speaks in its syntax. Not because it's trendy, because it works. SQL isn't just code, it's the quiet voice of order, in a noisy universe of data, 